just for one more Sean review, he reviews the Orville at one star. And it's, I, I, okay, just, so, I didn't love the Orville either. I just didn't hate it. I didn't think it was necessarily one star bad, which, I don't know. Maybe that's the problem. What am I complaining? I, I kind of love you, Shawnee B, because, like, you know what you like, and you know what you don't like, and I like that from a reviewer. We may disagree on all of your scores, but I don't let that stop you. You know, you do you, and then we can just argue over it. But let's let's move on. So let's get down to it, shall we? Day Made Amazes is a 2017 American fantasy adventure comedy budget horror. It was written by Steven Sears and Bill Watterson, and directed by Bill Watterson, and produced by Butter Stories Production. It is produced by Dave Maiden LLC, Warden Pictures, and distributed Dick Gravitas Ventures. It's reportedly had a very small budget, but despite all of my effort in looking, I have been unable to ascertain any budgetary numbers for this movie. Bill Watterson has commented on the budget several times and only has said that the actual budget was remarkably small. He has made jokes on that point through several interviews, but refuses to actually release the budgetary numbers, and... On that point, I will also admit that it is uncommon for a film festival movie to actually release the budget that the movie had. Most film festival movies, as a point of course, do not actually state their budget. It is kind of a secret thing in that film genre, so that is likely a large reason why we don't have an actual budget up to this date. I can say that it made $34,117 at box office. It premiered at the Slam Dance Film Festival, where it won the Best Narrative Award, and it continued to win a series of awards at successive film festivals, and it's been held in high regard by fans and critics alike ever since. Dave Made a Maze has a score of 6.3 on IMDb, and 86% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 4.4 out of 5 on Amazon, and 86% of Google users like this movie. But none of that matters. What really matters is this is a bad movie for you. Well, Dave Made a Maze is a fantastic movie. It's remarkable in its use of cardboard, and it's well worth watching for that alone. It's certain to leave you nostalgic for your own cardboard board building days. Lines are delivered well, and with comedic timing. The story is intriguing, there's remarkable effort, and there's art. Within a movie that does not make you feel like it's forcing anything artistic down your throat at all. This is all to say, however, if you are looking for cringe, if you are looking for bad line delivery... If you're looking to balk at nonsensical plots, you won't find that here. What you will find is a truly unique narrative that would be hard for anybody but Sean Barco to hate. Let's get to a bad movie breakdown, shall we? High five! Hey, you're ahead! Oh, jeez, that's not cranberry sauce! Well, watch me! <laughs> okay, so I frankly love the intro to this movie. The song gets my head bobbing every time. Making mazes is apparently only one of the many hobbies that Dave has taken up while his girlfriend is away, and it's it's kind of sad. I mean, I guess a broadband connection and bottle jerkins will only get you so far. It doesn't seem like it got Dave very far at all, because as far as we can tell, Dave lost his shit about the moment that Annie left. And understandably, he's tried out a few hobbies to try and keep himself busy. If this podcast was not nearly long enough, if you wanted much, 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 much more content... On Dave Made a Maze? There's always Dave Made a Minute. Dave Made a Minute is a podcast dedicated to Dave Made a Maze, which takes the movie apart literally minute by minute, episode by episode, which is just so f***ing absurd, and I love it. I'm probably going to be ashamed of how much I actually listened to it by the end of this. Anyway, so it's time to get back to the movie. So, Annie leaves, right? She leaves the apartment, and Dave just immediately tosses himself into a dozen hobbies, and we are still in the intro crawl, by the way. And we're talking just anything that would protect him from the darker regions of his own self-conscious. He tries painting, he tries playing keyboard, practicing origami, learning carpentry. He eventually settles, though, on building a box fort. It's, I'll admit, not an altogether terrible use of one's time. Truthfully, I haven't built a box fort since I was a kid. But that's not that I haven't thought about it. I have. Several times. I've just always kind of talked myself out of it. I feel like Dave would be so ashamed of my lack of commitment. It's it's just, I don't know. I'll build box play areas for cats and things like that, but I've always just... But I've always just stopped shy of building something for myself. It's just... 
I don't know where to get that many good boxes from, and I don't want to have to spend a lot of money on them, and I guess you would have to get them from a local business and just collect them on a Saturday or something like that. And if it was just boxes, who's going to stop you? And if they try to, you just run. You just run with your boxes. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's time to get quickly. Oh, yeah. The holy water. The holy water. Quickly. Oh, yeah. That was a close one. So, Dave, he's the one making the box forts, not Alan. And his box fort is, well, it's pretty cool looking. It's got an enter sign that lights up and a curtain door and a little side area for your Nintendo Wii. But it's, it's not very big. Honestly, there's a YouTuber, Papa Jake, and Papa Jake would look at this and he would laugh. At least looking at it from the outside. But then again, Papa Jake might just be a few box shorts that I have fallen into this Cthulian style nightmare himself. You really never know which one's gonna get you. I've seen his YouTube. He's got box forts going five stories high. You need to be careful, Papa Jake. One of these days, one of those box forts is gonna have a room you didn't build. And Dave might not warn you, but I will, so you gotta be careful with that double corrugated six ply. It's gonna be dangerous. Heavy duty paper cuts, man. Well, that. That and extra dimensional cretaceous subhuman origami monsters. Dave, though, he can't really warn Papa Jake right now, even if he wanted to. And he should. Dude's treading on thin ice. But Dave, Dave's trapped in his own cardboard fort. He's trapped and he can't get out. Which annoys Annie, like it should any girlfriend or boyfriend. But when she decides to try and come in after him, Dave warns her off. And as she shakes the fort, you can see the whole apartment shake. Dave, he didn't just make a fort. He meant a maze. A giant subspace labyrinth, really. And now he's stuck inside of it. He's been stuck for days, in fact, and he implores Annie not to tear it down. He's worked too hard on it. So Annie instead contacts several of Dave's friends in an attempt to get a handle on this situation. Now Gordon shows up with a beard on his face, a well-established beard. And I wouldn't want you to miss it and get confused with the story. So Gordon, he is the one with the beard on his face. Where was that beard at? Uh, on his face. Where's that beard at? Again, it's on his face, Raul. I already said that. Twice. Where was that beard at again? I'm sorry, I forgot. Vera! Uh, I just wanted to know where his beard was at. Why are you being so mean? I'm sorry, Vera. Gordon's beard is... It's on his face. Dumb. Why didn't you just say so in the first place? By the way, I love Gordon's t-shirt with the 8-bit warrior mage. It's pretty epic and a neat little bit of foreshadowing for what's about to come. We're not sure how long Annie and Dave have been together, but we definitely know that Greg knows Dave a bit better than Annie does, and sadly the counsel he has to give isn't as optimistic as one might hope. He acknowledges Dave's persona, and what appears to be the critical issue that is plaguing him in his life, his lack of follow-through. Which... actually, though, has been established pretty well at this point, even though we're less than 8 minutes into the movie. This big grand structure of Dave's, his double corrugated 12 point fiberboard fortress. This might be one of the first things that he's actually started and finished and there's some symbology here to address. It's not very obscure so just forgive me as I acknowledge the very very obvious this is probably one of the first projects Dave has ever completed. He's built the fort from inside out and as such his creation has both literally and figuratively swallowed him whole. What I also find fascinating is that this project has no real inherent value to it, aside from his own sense of completion. There's no reward for finishing it. There's no monetary compensation for his effort, no friendly praise, and no ability to share his creation with the world. But he is sharing it with the world. He's sharing it with this movie. Like most mazes, the nature of his construction materials makes it an exceedingly temporary creation. But also, he hasn't quite finished yet. And... He's injured himself. And he's trapped, obviously. One tries to communicate with him from the outside, but it's not working. The labyrinth is larger on the inside. Dave suggests making some sandwiches and throwing them into the labyrinth with the hope that he'll find them. And Gordon, he calls Leonard for backup. And Leonard comes with the whole posse intact. We've got a whole film crew alongside several other friends, all looking over Dave's maze and trying to figure out what to do to save him. Eventually deciding to form a search party and go into the maze and try and look for Dave. It's a dumb and dangerous idea that Dave tried to dissuade them from, warning them of the traps and the cardboard obstacles that await. It's a threat not taken seriously enough at all. The group of partygoers is pretty big, filling this little apartment to its brim. There's Annie, Gordon, Greg, Bryn, Leonard, Harry, Jane, a cameraman, a boom mic operator, two Flemish tourists, and a hobo, all just hanging out and checking out Dave's creation. In all fairness, Annie does try to go in by herself, but everybody thinks it's going to be a fun time, which it kind of is. 
Even with the threat of death looming overhead, the whole crew shuffles in through the bath towel door, super optimistic, into a giant plain cardboard room with one adjacent hallway attached as Gordon steers to examine the walls of this maze. Running his hands along them, he cuts himself on the cardboard, forming a deep gash that draws a fresh trail of blood. Blood drips onto the floor before being absorbed by the cardboard, which seems to lap it up eagerly, and almost as though it's hungry. Hungry and waiting for flesh. This is something that Gordon tries to shrug off, but it's obvious that it follows him. And as they journey through the hallways to find their first dead end, alongside a button that's labeled, Don't Push Gordon, a button which, of course, Harry has to push, a button which releases a booby trap boxing glove which punches Gordon in the balls. The set work is all wonderful here. The sound work, as well, as the faux acoustics really provide a sense of death, and the room by room is just so artistically done. Many thanks to the Cardboard Institute of Technology. They're an art group out of San Francisco, California, and they helped with many of the more detailed pieces that you'll see throughout the film. It's really hard to go into all the art here. I mean, it's it's not too hard, but that's what Dave Made a Minute is for. How much time do you really want me to spend? The whole next section of the hallway is screened off by playing cards. There are playing cards on the wall. There are giant cardboard epitaphs to the king and queen, inlaid into the arch cardboard hallway, followed seconds later by giant keyboard motifs that are much cooler and much more 80s that I feel like I'm going to be able to properly relay here. 80 cents starts to play in the background. It, it all just kind of comes together, and there's a podcast that just takes this whole movie and breaks it up minute by minute, and I think we can see why. I think 10 seconds later they're stepping into a hallway of keyboard keys, then sliding into the subliminal spaces where the back keys lie. Because, of course, there's just black nothingness where the black keys should be. And traveling through these transdimensional ebony doorways, they stumble into a cardboard trash compactor. A trash compactor that would be straight out of Star Wars if it didn't have a giant gaping maw of the Gnome King offset in the opposite corner of the room. Well, that and exchange the tentacle monsters for a bunch of origami cranes, and I suppose you're pretty much there. The boom mic operator engages in an epic battle with the biggest of the cranes, fighting it back, stabbing and killing it. You know, as the poor creature kind of struggles for life. A lot of Dave's creations remind me of Forky from Toy Story, in that they probably shouldn't be alive, and they probably don't want to be. There's really nothing suggesting the origami monster was trying to harm anyone. The poor thing was just struggling to survive in the same trash compactor as everyone else. And then the old boom mic operator just goes and stabs them. It's so sad. I know, Vera. I know it is. And then they just leave the poor bird, escaping through the Gnome King's mouth into the next section of the mage, which is apparently relatively safe, at least for now. So while Leonard is finally making his way into the maze, Harry takes the short opportunity to sit Annie down and start drilling her, like this is her own little episode of Dateline, which, in all fairness, it kind of is. He does ask some interesting questions. Some questions I'd like answers to. Most notably, how and when Dave gained the ability to grant life to inanimate objects. I mean... This is a serious power for any dungeon master to bestow onto their characters, and I don't know what Rick was thinking allowing this into the game. But any experienced dungeon master knows that there are certain cards you just don't play. They will ruin your game. You don't let your characters talk you into. There are absolute no discussion points, such as, no, you can't control life and death. No, you can't control time. And no, you can't have red eyes. Because like, just stop asking. I don't care how much you like Akame. It's not happening. But Hobo Rick, hanging outside of the fort, watching the whole thing go down, our dungeon master in disguise, he's already made that mistake. And just like Pandora's box, once the origami monsters have escaped their transdimensional cardboard fort, you can't put them back in no more. So at this point, we just have to hope that Dave doesn't abuse his powers. And see? Right there? Right in the boom mic operator's shoulders? One of the origami birds? Just hanging out? Totally harmless. And out of nowhere, Jane the Barbarian rushes in and just, sadly, ignorantly steps on a trap. We see the cardboard gears begin to grind underneath the deadly labyrinth as Jane the Barbarian, uncertain of what to do, freezes in place. I know, I know, she's a crap barbarian. Better luck on those rolls next time, Jane, because this is old school D&D. We're talking second edition here, bitches, and with faco charts and no safe kills. And guess what kind of trap you just stepped on, Jane? Jane. Out of nowhere, a cardboard blade shears her head clean off. It falls to the floor. Bright ribbons gushing from her neck. And just like that, Jane the Barbarian is dead. Oh no, that's one party member down. Without Jane the Barbarian, there's one less tank to try and throw in front of that minotaur. It's not looking great for our party members, but stay tuned to find out if Dave the Mage will actually finally cast a spell. Discover if Annie the Paladin will finally get to complete her quest to save her boyfriend. 
And will Greg and Bryn, our Bard and Rogue combo, finally get their act together and start sniffing out these traps? Or is another party member going to have to get decapitated before they...